if you order my steps. And all of us, that should be our desire, Sister Howard, that God would order our steps. And I pray that's your desire. The Bible even says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And we just pray that God's blessings will continue. Bad Brother Matt, good to see you again, Ben. Amen. God's blessing will continue to be upon our lives. Thank you, choir. Thank you, preachers. Thank you, deacons. Thank you, deaconess. Thank you, our greeters and our ushers. Thank you to all of our sound and AV team that does a great job in presenting the sound and in person and on the internet. We just give God all the praise and glory and honor for each and every last one of you. But turn your Bibles with me this morning to the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 2. The Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 2. Since the first Sunday of this month, Pastor Chip and I have been tag team preaching doing a sermon series entitled Reasons Why. Reasons Why. On first Sunday of last month, we talked about why communion. Why is it that every first Sunday, like today, we share in the Lord's Supper, we give out Holy Communion. Been doing it for years, and some women are, well, why do we do that? And we talked, preached from that First Corinthians that day, and the reason why we serve the Lord's Supper is to remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the wafer that represents his body, the juice that represents his blood. And then following that, we wanted to share with you why do we have a church mission statement. If you walk into our fellowship hall, where they serve the coffee out on each of your side, feel on, the, on our wall of our fellowship hall, our mission statement. And our mission statement is to exalt the Savior, equip the saints, and evangelize the sinner. That's what we're here for. That's what our purpose is as a congregation, to exalt the Savior, equip the saints, and evangelize the sinner. So second Sunday of last month, that's Chip preached an incredible sermon from Psalms 100 that why exalt the Savior? And he just had two points. We exalt the Savior because God is God. And then because God is good. Great, great message. On third Sunday, I preached a sermon from Ephesians 6 on why do we equip the saints? Why is that part of our mission statement? Why do we equip the saints? And we talked about we equip the saints so we can stand against the attacks of the enemy. That's why we have Sunday school. Vic, Vic, that's why we have Bible study. That's why we have all these ministries, brothers, our men's ministry, ladies, the women's ministry, youth and young adult, the children's ministry, youth ministry. We do that. We equip you so that after the benediction, when the enemy jumps all on you, that you and I will be able to stand against the attacks of the enemy. And then last Sunday, I was supposed to complete the mission statement on why I equipped the saints, I mean, why I evangelized the sinner. But I was in grief because of my uh, sister's death, so I asked Pastor Janelle Thomas uh, to preach, and boy, did he preach. He preached, he preached, and 38 people came down the aisle. So today I will conclude the mission statement, why we do what we do is exalt the Savior, evangelize, I mean, equip the saints. And I want to talk about this morning, why evangelize the sinner? Why do we and Darrow and Choi and our evangelistic ministry, why did it go out each and every week to evangelize the sinner? Mark chapter 2 is where I'll be preaching from this morning. I want you to look at with me verses 1 through 5 of that chapter. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 of that chapter. If you have it, please say amen. amen. You find these similar words. And again, he entered the Capernaum. After some days, and it was heard that Jesus was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Verse 3, then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. 
Father, we thank you and we praise you for this incredible time of worship. Thank you for Pastor Ernest. Thank you for the altos, the sopranos, the tenors, and the bass. Thank you for these gifted musicians. Thank you for this song service, God, and how it's already blessed our hearts, even before the preacher has gotten up to preach. Thank you for our members, our guests, those in person, those watching by way of internet. Now, God is always hiding me behind the cross. Father, let them not see Fred, but God, let them see Christ. So then, God, that you may be glorified, the saints of God may be edified, Satan may be horrified, and lost sinners will come to repentance. And God, when it's all said and done, we're so very careful to give your name all the praise, give your name all the glory, and we give your name all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray and for us say, let people of God say, amen. amen. Mark again, chapter 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. With that text in mind, with that scripture in mind, brothers and sisters, I want to preach this morning talking about evangelizing the sinner from the subject, bringing others to Jesus. Dr. Bowie, bringing others to Jesus. Frank Lambert, one of the most important decisions anyone can make is to become a Christian. Amen. Henderson, uh, one of the most important decisions that anyone can make is to become a follower of Jesus Christ. But barely, barely one of the most important decisions that anyone can make, Carlos, is to become born again. And the reason that decision is so important, the reason that decision is so imperative, the reason that decision is so critical, the reason that decision, Brother Earl, is so crucial is because all of us by nature are sinners. Look at the person next to you and say, yeah, even you are a sinner. Now you turn back at them and say, yeah, you are a sinner also. All of us by nature, some of y'all enjoy it there, that, huh? I've been wanting to tell them he was a sinner all week long. All of us by nature are lost. I know we're dressed up now and we're looking good in our black suits and white shirts and red ties, but, but preachers and deacons, all of us by nature are lost. All of us by nature, Gerald and Rashawn, are transgressors. All of us by nature were born in sin, Mr. Susil, and shaped in iniquity. That's why the Bible says, Pastor O'Connor in Romans 3 and 10, there is none that are righteous, no, not one. No, and Glenn, that's why the Bible says in Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Students from Xavier and Dillard and uh, you know, you know uh, that's why Genesis 6 and 5 says, and God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. All right, that's why Psalm 53 and 3 says, there is none who does good, who does good no, not one. Isaiah 53 and 6 says, all we like sheep. While you're all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone uh, to his own way and the Lord has laid on him, uh, Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. Count in 1 John 1 and 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves uh, and the truth, Donald, the truth, Suzette, uh, uh, the truth, Bill, the truth, uh, brother, is not in us. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, all of us by nature are lost. Uh, all of us by nature, Sam and Kim, are transgressors. Uh, all of us by nature, Diane, are sinners. All of us by nature are lost. And the Bible is very definite. The Bible is very clear. The Bible is very specific when it talks about mankind and our sinful nature. Listen to Romans chapter 6. Brother Reeves and Sister Reeves in verse 23 says, For the wages of sin, guy, is debt. Anthony, the wages of sin is debt. The payment of sin, preachers, is debt. The consequences of sin, uh, Brother Washington and Sister Washington, is dead. In other words, according to the Bible, because we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity, all of us in here deserve to die in our sins. 
All of us in here deserve to go to hell because of our sins. All of us in here deserve to burn in torment Brother Tony, because of our sins. However, somebody say however. Because of God's grace for us, giving us what we don't deserve. Because of God's mercy for us, not giving us what we do deserve. And because of God's love for us, uh, willing to give you and I another chance. That's why Tony, that's why Keith, that's why John 3.16 said, for God so what? Because he loved the world. So Robert, he loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him, Jerry, should not perish. Agnes Cain have everlasting uh, life. That's our Romans 5 and 6 say, For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died, Corinth. Christ died, Terry, for the ungodly. That's our Romans 5 and 8 say, But God demonstrated his love uh, towards you and me, Brother Reese, uh, uh, Ronald and Karen, uh, 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 Brother Sister White, uh, G uh, Geraldo and Lacey. God demonstrated his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, God did not wait till you stop cussing. He didn't stop wait till you stop drugging. He didn't stop wait till you stop drinking. He didn't stop wait till you stop here. God did not wait because God knew we couldn't do that on our own. That's why Romans 5, but God demonstrated, God showed his love to us. Get you, particularly that while we were yet sinners, Kyran, Christ died uh, for us. Therefore, if you are a Christian today, at some point in your life, someone told you about Jesus. If you are a believer today, at some point in your life, someone testified to you about Jesus. If you are a believer today, at some point, Tony, in your life, someone introduced you uh, to Jesus Christ. At some point in your life, somebody told you of a man, Brother Creighton, that can change your life. And Brother Goodwill, Sister Goodwill, ever since that day, our lives have never ever been the same. As a matter of fact, listen to 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. It says, ushers uh, 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 in reality about life. Listen to what the Bible said. Therefore, if anyone, I don't care who you are, I don't care how dark your past, I don't care what you did in your past life, the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, Brother George, he or she is a what? A new creation. Sister Wilkinson, Brother Wilkinson, all things have passed away. And Sister Baptiste, all things now have become new. In other words, a Bill of Vanessa in Georgia, Sabaka's there in Texas, uh, Terry and Sheila in Florida, Sister Eugene in Texas. In other words, my brother, as well, once you become a Christian, uh, Brother Noel there in Baton Rouge, uh, once you become a follower of Jesus Christ, once you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, once you become born again, Again, your life and my life has never ever again been the same so, you know once you become a Christian once you become a follower once you become a disciple once you become born again your life brother Ukraine and my life has never been this can I have about a thousand believers to say amen to that can I have about a thousand people who know you've been changed to say amen to that Ladies and gentlemen, how many in this sanctuary can testify that, that once you became reborn, once you became renewed, once you became re reconciled, once you became rescued, once you became redeemed, you are no longer, Sister Guru, the same. Once you gave your heart and your life to Christ and Jesus Tabitha came in you and, and just came in me, shall we have never, ever have been the same. And that was the mindset of these four brothers in our text. Brian, that was the mindset of these four individuals in our text. That was the mentality of these four men in our text. That was the thinking of the evil of these four men in our text. The paralytic in this text is a picture of a helpless person in his or her sin without Christ. But Mac, the paralytic in our text is a picture of how hopeless a person is in his or her sin without Christ. The paralytic in our text is a picture of how desolate people are without Christ. Terry, the paralytic in our text is a picture of how dismal uh, a person is, Brother Joe Goins, in their life uh, without Christ. And to make matters worse, this man cannot do anything to cure his own sickness. Keith, he could not do anything to cure his own illness. 
to add insult to injury, he could not get himself to Jesus without somebody coming to his aid. He was paralyzed and confined to a cot. So even if he wanted to know, he could not get to Jesus on his own. Even if he desired to, he could not get to Jesus by himself. So the Bible says, the scripture says, and ladies and gentlemen, thank God there were four brothers. That Darrell evangelism team, thank God there were believers. Thank God there were individuals who were so concerned uh, about his future. Sister Quinn, who was so concerned about his future, Sister Mitchell was concerned about his future, that was about him, about his salvation, that they decided we need to get this man to Jesus Christ. They were concerned about his situation. They were concerned about his future. And like man of my brothers and my sisters, every last one of us in here knows someone who's lost. Every last one of us in here, from the preacher, from the deacons, from the deaconess, from the choir members, every last one of us in here knows somebody who's unchurched. Every last one of us knows somebody whose life is being destroyed because of the disease of sin. And even though we cannot heal them of their sin, we can introduce them to somebody that can. We can't heal them because of their sin. But we can introduce them to somebody that can. We can introduce them, uh, Brother Williams, to the healer. Well, brothers and sisters, that's the only hope for our nation. That's the only hope for our country. That's the only hope for our cities. That's the only hope for our communities. That's the only hope for mankind. Lost men and women need someone to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Lost teenagers need someone to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Lost college students need someone to introduce them uh, to Jesus Christ. Murderers need someone to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Gangbangers need somebody to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Rapists need somebody to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Carjackers need somebody to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Criminals need somebody to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Thieves need somebody to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Bullies, 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 bullies need somebody to Introduce them, Brother Brian, to Jesus Christ. Because the fact of the matter, Brother Briscoe, they cannot change by themselves. Right, Rocky, they, they cannot change by, they cannot be delivered by themselves. They cannot be set free by themselves. They cannot be made whole by themselves. Just like the paralytic Denise in our text. Just like you and me in my BC days. I can't speak for nobody in here. But in my BC days, I enjoyed sin. Come on, I ain't the only one. I ain't the only one. Come on, Ralph, wave your hand. Wave, wave your hand, Ralph. Amen. In my BC day, come on, bro. wave your hand. Come on, bro. I, I see the hand, Brother Curtis. Uh, brother George, thank you, bro. I enjoyed sin. But I didn't realize my sin was leading me to a life of destruction. Uh, uh, but thank God somebody prayed for me. Ernest, somebody prayed for me, bro. Had me on their mind, Harold. Took the time uh, to pray for me. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad they prayed. Josie, I'm so glad they prayed. Uh, I'm so glad they prayed. Uh, for me. Therefore, Franklin Avenue, what can we do to impact the lostness in our community, the lostness in our city? What can we do to impact the crime in our communities, in our city? What can we do to reach those who are causing fear in your neighborhood and, and in my neighborhood? What can we do to reach those who are causing anxiety when we see them coming down the street? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we must do what these four men did in our text. They brought this man to Jesus. We must, Verna, evangelize the sinner. Just like you and just like you and just like you and just like me. They brought this man. We must do the same for the lost and the unchurched in our communities and our cities. So how do we do it? How do we reach the lost? So Phillips, Jarvis, 
Then he said, how do we reach the church? How do we bring others to Jesus? How do we evangelize Angela and David the sinner? Well, our text gives us the answer. There are four things according to this text that these men did to bring this one man to Jesus Christ. And if we apply these four things to our lives, things can also happen in your life and my life for those who don't know Jesus. Number one, we, first of all, we must care. We must care. We must care. Look at verse 3. The Bible says, then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Hank, Sheila, they cared about this man's condition. Clawson, they, they, they cared about this man's situation. They cared about this man's lostness. They cared enough to bring him to Jesus Christ. I admire our evangelism ministry. They go out in places that some of y'all would never even want to drive by. And it's not that they don't have nothing better to do. But Paul, it's not that they don't have something different. They, they care about lostness. They care about lost people. They care about lost situations. And I know everybody can't be on the evangelist team, but everybody knows somebody that's lost. But we must care about them. Ladies and gentlemen, they cared enough to bring this man to Jesus Christ. And like man and my brothers and my sisters, if we intend to reach the lost, we must care about them. We, but we must care. Pastor Dixon, we, we must do care about that. We must do all that we can to reach them. Think about it. That's somebody's son. That's somebody's daughter. That's somebody's grandson. That's somebody's granddaughter. We must care about them. We must care about their condition. We must care about their situation. We must care about their losses. We must care about their struggles. We must care about their strongholds. We must care about their hurts. We must care, preachers, about their habits. We must care about their hangups. Somebody put it so well, people don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. And Carlos and Greg will show them how much we care when we bring them to Jesus, when we evangelize the sinner. Not just invite them to church, but invite them to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. No, you may not be comfortable going on Shepherd to a highway or, or going into different areas of the city, but you can invite that lost person to your church. You, you know them, they're your friends, they're, they're your co-workers, they're your neighbors, uh, 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 they're your business partners. You, you may not be comfortable going out on the street and, and knocking on doors, or, but you can care enough for them that you say, hey, can I invite you to my church? You have a relationship with them. They're your friend, they're your relative, they're your associate, they're your neighbor. And so you can invite them to your church, but invite them to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. When you invite them, invite them with the purpose that when they come here, they'll have an encounter with Jesus Christ. Don't just invite them to hear the pastor preach. Invite them to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. Don't just invite them to hear the choir sing, because although the choir is singing real good, uh, but invite them to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. Don't just invite them to hear the deacons uh, pray, but invite them to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. Don't just invite them to see this beautiful building that God has blessed us with, but invite them to have an an encounter with Jesus Christ because I've said it for years and years and years. It's not about the pastor. It's about the master. It's not about the singing. It's about the savior. It's not about the deacons. It's about the deity. It's not about the building. It's about the bright and morning star for Jesus says, and if I, and if I, and if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Don't worry about what's going to happen. You just invite them and the Spirit of God has a way of convicting their hearts and their lives and their souls that something is said that they want to come running down the aisle. What must I do to be saved? These four men gold in this text was not to get their friend to a building, to a house, but their goal was to get their friend to Jesus by any means necessary. Do you care enough about the lost people that you know to invite them to have an encounter with Jesus Christ? 
And like man and my brothers and my sisters, we must do our best to get the lost and unchurched to Jesus by any means necessary. But then there's a second thing. Uh, Judge Pittman, there's a second thing, Dr. Barnes, there's a second thing, uh, Jerome and Mary, that we must do to evangelize the sinner. Not only we must care, but secondly, we must cooperate. Because it, secondly, we must cooperate. Look at verse 3. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Don't miss this. Then they came to him bringing, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Not only must we care, secondly, Briscoe, we must cooperate. Notice not just one of them brought this man to Jesus. Notice not just two of them brought this man to Jesus. Notice not just three of them brought this man to Jesus. But the Bible said all four of these men brought this one man to Jesus Christ. In other words, they all worked together to get this man to Jesus Christ. And like man, Brother Simon, like man, Mr. Parker, and like man, the brother said, we almost cooperate to get the lost to Jesus Christ. We almost cooperate to evangelize the sinner. We almost cooperate to get the unchurched to Jesus Christ. In other words, uh, everybody, when they come into this place, must play their part. You don't know who people are bringing. You don't know who people have invited. And so all of us must cooperate uh, uh, to other people, to that person, to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, greeters, greet them with a smile and a welcome as they come through the door. If your feet hurting that day, don't greet. Because you can't smile and you got bad bunions and bad coins. Just don't greet that Sunday. Go, go sit down. Get your seat. But greet them as they come through the door with a smile. Ushers, show hospitality to them uh, as you help them find a seat. Members, uh, when they come on your row, say hello to them as they take their seat. Uh, in other words, speak to them. You don't know them, but speak to them. Good morning. How you doing? They're in church. They're not in a club. Uh, they're not in a strip club. They're in church. So if you're a member of the church, at least speak to them. I don't know your name, but good morning. Uh, I don't know what you're going but good morning. Members, speak to them. We are doing choir and musicians lift up Jesus and music uh, and praise as you minister in songs deacon and deaconess point them to Jesus in your time of devotion preachers let them see Jesus in our sermons uh, as we preach the word of God congregation pray for the lost and on church while the invitation is getting yes it will take all of us cooperating together to reach the lost to reach the unchurched. Remember, ministry is a marathon, not a sprint. Ministry is a marathon, not a sprint. I got saved in 77, but it took three years for me to really get it together. Ministry is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Think about it. Someone said it like this. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Brothers and sisters, let's cooperate by working together to reach the lost and unchurched. Then there's a third thing these guys did to evangelize this center. We must care, we must cooperate. And then number three, we must be creative. Then we must be creative. You know, we must be creative. We must be creative. Dan and Winterfoot, we must be creative. Look at verse four. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was, so when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. We must be creative. Verses 1 and 2 say there were so many people in this house that the house was jam-packed. I mean, the house was jam-packed. No one can get through the front door. No one can get through the back door. But the Bible, no one can get on the, to the window, on the left, on the right. And so they knew they had to still get this man to Jesus Christ. So the Bible says they had to get this man to Jesus into this house. Now, because they cared, they could have said, well, bro, we tried the front door. Nobody can't get you in. Well, bro, we tried the back door. Can't get you in. Can't get you through the windows. They could have said, well, bro, sorry. We did our best. No, they didn't do that. Because they cared, Brother Clarence, about this man's condition. But Alexander, Brother Brooks, because they cared about his situation, they became a creator. One of the guys said, wait, bro, before we give up, 
Last summer, in between jobs, I used to work for the Capernaum Roofing Company. We put a lot of roofs on these houses, and I know the roof is made of very thin material. If we can get this brother to the roof, we can make a hole and get him down to Jesus Christ. There had to be creative, Keith, to get this man to Jesus Christ. Well, and like man of my brothers and my sisters, if we expect to reach this millennial, if we expect to reach this Generation Z, if we expect to reach these individuals who don't care nothing about God, nothing about the church, nothing about authority, nothing about morals, nothing about values, if we expect to reach them uh, when they come here, we got to be creative uh, in getting them uh, to get involved in the church. Think about it. Uh, those of us who are 50 years or older, uh, all we had at one time was just worship. That was one worship service. That was it. And at one worship service, everybody worshiped together. Great Mount Carmel Baptist Church, first all in Galveston, when my mom drug us to church, everybody, all the adults went there, all the teenagers went there, all the, everybody was in the church uh, together at one time. All of us, uh, everyone attended together. How many of y'all remember that? We were all in church together. Everyone worships together, the babies and children and teenagers and adults. Uh, and y'all remember when a baby start crying, what would happen? One of the ushers would stick their hand and say, give me that baby. And they would take your baby and bring that baby outside. So that baby would stop. Come on, some of y'all know what I'm about. But Ed, some of y'all, y'all remember, man. And so that baby stopped crying, uh, and then they would bring that baby back. Mama would say, oh, take him, take him, take him, take him, in Jesus' name. So it's almost that they were relieved uh, that somebody came uh, and got that crying baby. But old things are different today. We have to be creative uh, to reach this generation. We got to be creative in doing things. Uh, now we have nurseries. Usher, don't, y'all don't have to come and get the same uh, crying babies. Now we have nurseries uh, where we can bring our bad, I mean our crying children. <laughs> Lord have mercy. And Chip and Kim were babies, man. Sooner we got to church, take them nursery, take them. We want to have peace. We want to have peace. We got creative now. We got nurses to take care of our babies. Uh, uh, we, have to, we have children's church, Pastor, Tom, Pastor William, to take care of our children from ages 6 to 12. Uh, uh, Pastor Greg, we have youth church now for youth from uh, 12, uh, uh, 12 to 18. Uh, we have singles ministry. For our singles, we have to be creative. Uh, we have marriage ministry, Pastor Will. Uh, for married couples, we have to be creative. Uh, we have to huddle men, uh, but know that men can come together and learn how to be priests, protectors, us and the provider of their family. We had to get creative. We have school pride Sunday. We have liturgical dance. We have back to school rallies. We have harvest fest. We have uh, the internet to read. We have drama ministry now in the church because we're doing all that to reach them. The only drama we had in the church that I grew up with, which, which uh, a lady uh, uh, would, would shout that day and when she shouted if her wig would fall off. Come on, some of y'all remember that. That wig would fall off, man. Jew, man, we were, we laugh, we laugh, we laugh. We didn't, but we, that was the only drama we had back then. But today we got to do anything we can. Look at the sister calls it. She said, yeah, I remember those days. I remember those days. I think one little time it was my wig. I don't know what it was. But you know what stopped people in our church? With, uh, uh, Anthony and uh, Dixon was talking about, you know what stopped people from uh, shouting in the church I grew up in? When they brought out the ammonia smelling sauce. <laughs> Bruh, you get one hit of, oh! You get one hit of that ammonia smelling sauce, you didn't shout no more, Sister Carter. I mean, they will crack open that ammonia smelling sauce, or you shout, okay. Ah! I thought I've almost killed us, Conrad. You remember? But we got to get creative and reaching people today in our churches. Ladies and gentlemen, we must be creative to reach the Lord. That's why we have over 40 ministries now in our church to be creative to reach the lost. So
so we got to be creative to reach the church. Now, we also must be really careful in our creativity. I got to say this. This is Janice. We got to be careful in our, but the clock to the clock, we got to be cre- careful in our creativity. We must be careful in how creative we get. Yes, we want to reach the lost. Yes, we want to reach the unchurched. However, we must be careful as we uh, change some methods to be creative. Let me say that again. We must be careful as we change some methods to be creative. Our message always stays the same. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, that's the met you must never ever change the with the methods may change, uh, but the message is always Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and for yes, change the methods to reach them, but the message is always about Jesus Christ who hung bled and died on Calvary for our sins. And finally, brothers and sisters, we intend to reach others. If we intend to evangelize the sinner, we must care about them. We must cooperate to reach them. We must be creative to come up with ways that we didn't have growing up, but we need today. And then finally, we must care, we must cooperate, we must be creative, and then number four, we must be committed. Rhoda, we must be committed. Now we must be committed. Look at verses four and five as I come to a close. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, then cover the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, the, and when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, don't miss this. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. We must be committed. Look again at uh, uh, verses 4 and 5. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith. Brothers and sisters, Burkhalter, these men were willing to do whatever it took. They, they knew whatever it took to get this one man to Jesus Christ. I never forget when I got saved, when I gave my heart to the Lord. Some of you heard the story. I Charity Hospital, I got in a wheelchair, called Elizabeth. I said, baby, you were not, I gave my life to Jesus. She hung up. Yeah, I heard that before. Click. I said, Beth, seriously. I got, uh, Brother Baloney challenged me, and I, I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life. She said, yeah, Fred, I'll believe it when I see it. I believe it when I see it. They were committed to get this one man to Jesus because Jesus was the only one who could change this man's condition. Jesus was the only one who would change this man's situation. Therefore, they were committed to do all they could to get this man to Jesus. They cared. Preachers, they cooperated. Ministry leaders, they were creative. In church, they were committed. They sacrificed. They gave. They prayed. They did whatever was necessary to evangelize this sinner, to get this man to Jesus Christ who could change his life forever. Because look what happened in verse 5. Jesus, in verse 5, when uh, Jesus is preaching in verse 4, and as he preaches, in verse 4, they uncover the roof, and Jesus is preaching, then all of a sudden he sees this hole starts coming in the roof. And stuff starts coming off the roof and dropping, and everybody... Stop listening to Jesus. They start looking up. Jesus stopped this sermon and said, what in the world is going on? Then they saw this small hole get larger and, and larger and larger and larger. And then it was large enough that Jesus saw these four men struggling. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on. Not yet. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Not yet. Uh, these four men who cared, who cooperated, who were creative, and they lured this man to the only person that could change his life. And when Jesus saw their fate on Sheffman Till Highway, when Jesus saw their fate on Tara Lane, when Jesus saw their fate in the community, when Jesus saw the fate of the four men 
that, Lord, this man, Jesus healed and set free the paralytic man. And like man of my brothers and my sisters, as I come to a close, I want to issue a challenge to us today. As we close this part out about our mission statement. All of us have a loss of unchurched friend. All of us have a loss of unchurched relative. All of us have an associate or business partner. All of us have a loss of unchurched neighbor or classmate. Let's start praying for that person. Let's start interceding for that person. Let's start standing in the gap for that person. And let's pray that God will give us an opportunity to invite that person to your local church. Not to come here to preach or preach. Not to come here to choir sing. Not to come here to deacons pray. Not to come to see our building. But invite them to meet a man named Jesus who can change their life. Invite them to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. Invite them to who can change their situation. Who can change their circumstances. Who can forgive them of their sins. So come on brothers. Come on sisters. Come on college students. Come on high school students. Come on elementary school students. Come on senior soldiers. Come on couples. Come on singles. Come on Franklin Avenue. Let's do all we can to bring others to Jesus Christ. Let's do all we can to evangelize the sinner. But in order for that to happen, we must care. We must cooperate. We must be creative. And we must be committed so that Jesus can become real in their lives like he became real in our lives. The songwriter said, I've heard uh, the joy bell sound. Uh, Jesus says, uh, Jesus says, uh, I'm going to tell it uh, all around. Uh, Jesus saves, Keith, Peggy, Jesus saves uh, to the utmost. Jesus saves uh, to the utmost. Jesus saves. Uh, how many know he'll pick you up and he'll turn you around? Somebody know what I'm talking about. Say hallelujah. 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 Jesus saves. Why evangelize the sinner? Because people are lost, dying, and going to hell. And only Jesus can change their lives. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to preach. Why do we have a mission statement? Why do we say exalt the Savior? Why do we equip the saints? Why do we evangelize the sinner? Now, God, I pray that your word will not return void, but will accomplish those things that we wanted to accomplish. God, even as we pray, God, somebody's making a decision. Even as we pray, God, somebody needs to know you as Lord and Savior. So, God, I pray that the Holy Spirit will touch the hearts of men and women, teenagers, college students, boys and girls that don't have a relationship with you. Because one day we're going to die. And if we don't have you as Lord and Savior, we will spend eternity in a place called hell that wasn't created for us for the devil and his angels. So God, at this time of invitation, touch all over this building. Touch those, those watching by way of internet. Move in your heart. Move in their hearts and their lives. And let them know the same thing you did for the paralytic, you can do in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And for us, say, let people of God say, as we stand all over the building, the doors of the church are now open. My brother, my sister, if you're here today, and if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, this sermon is for you. This is your opportunity to get right. You don't have to be embarrassed. You don't have to be ashamed. You in the house of God. All of us are concerned about you. All of us are concerned about your losses. If you would die today, do you know where you'll spend eternity? That's the question. These four men thought enough of their friend that if he died without Jesus Christ, his future was hopeless. So we want to extend an opportunity for you today, my brother, my sister. If you're coming from the upper tier, we're going to wait on you. Anybody on the middle tier, we're going to wait on you. Anybody on the lower tier, we're going to wait on you. Several invitations. If you're not saved and you need to get right with God, you can come. Come tell the person next to you, excuse me, I need to make my way down that aisle. Come give these preachers your hand. Uh, give the Lord your heart. Our second invitation. You're already saved. You're already born again. But you need a church home. You need somewhere to grow and develop in the things of God. Well, we invite you to come and be a part of our family here at Franklin Avenue Baptist Church. Our third invitation, if you just stand in the need of prayer, 
You need somebody to pray with you and for you. You're struggling with some issues. You're struggling with some strongholds. You're struggling with some things in your life. And you don't really know what to do on your own. You can come right now. And then our fourth invitation. If you're a backslider, you turned your back on the Lord. Guess what? You can come home today. Why? Because God loves the backslider. You're pre-listening to one. God loves the backslider. And he can change your life. He can change your situation. What about you, my brother? What about you, my sister? If you want to give your heart and your life to the Lord, we invite you to do it right now. Don't worry about who's here. Don't worry about who's not here. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. God bless you. I see you. I see you. Come on. We got about two more minutes. We got to serve the Lord's Supper. We have Sunday school, fresh start, new members class. Come on. What you searching for? What are you looking for? Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. The Spirit of God says come. The bride says come. Whosoever will let him come and drink of the water of life freely. God loves you. He really does. And God has a plan just for your life. If not you, who? If not now, when? Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. If you're watching by way of internet, there's a number on your screen. 504 488 88 extension 312 that's my personal extension no one answers that number but me and so if you want to call that number and say preacher I need to get right with God uh, I'm like that paralytic my life is a mess uh, my life is messed up uh, and I've been trying to do it on my own but I can't do it by myself I need to give my heart and my life to Jesus Christ if that's you call that number 504-488-8488 extension 312 and God can change your life we got about one more minute we've got to close out we've got the Lord's Supper we have Sunday school new members class fresh start but we don't want to close out without giving you 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 opportunity to, to say yes to the Lord, yes to his way, and yes to his will. What about you, my brother? What about you, my sister? Come on and give your heart and give your life to Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can change our situation. He's the only one that can change our circumstance. He's the only one that can change your life. Turn it around. Place your feet on solid ground. Why don't you come? Why don't you say yes to the Lord? Yes to his way and yes to his will. We got 30 seconds left. We've got to close out. 30 seconds left. Come on, my brother. Come on, my sister. And give your heart uh, and give your life to Jesus Christ. And I promise you, your life will never, ever again uh, be the same. Father, we're not finished. We just have to quit. Time on the clock tells us we got to get out of here. Serve the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. But God, we don't want to close out. But I've given somebody an opportunity to say yes to the Lord, yes to his way, and yes to his will. God, I know in a crowd this side, there are others that need to come, but I pray, God, that you don't give them any peace until they find the peace of Jesus Christ in their hearts and in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray and for us. Let the people of God say, amen.